Uh, so I'm going to talk about something that might be a little different today, which is a little more on computer architecture, and uh, but applied to, to deep learning. So hopefully there's enough uh, context, or, or you're all secret computer architects, that it, uh, it all makes sense. Uh, and this is uh, an overview and work done by my students, Matthew Hall. Matthew's actually here, so he's here in case there are any really hard questions. So he sat near the front so I can do a lateral to him, uh, Mohamed al Zafrawi and Andrew Boutros, who's currently at Intel and will be back at University of Toronto in a few months. Okay, so why do we even care? Like, why do we um, need to have efficient inference, and why do we need to think about computer hardware to do that? Uh, well, clearly deep learning is going all over the place. So uh, fraud detection, medical diagnosis, clearly uh, speech to speech recognition, facial recognition in your doorbells, factory automation, and uh, driver assist, and perhaps one day self-driving cars. So lots of different places where deep learning is going um, because its accuracy is, is so good. It's outperforming prior algorithms now by large margins. But deep learning outperforms prior algorithms at a higher computational cost. So making the networks bigger makes them better. Uh, but that means that you need a lot of computation to get a good result. So this is a result from Vivian Z of MIT from a keynote she gave uh, a few months ago. And this is showing the accuracy of object detection with a few different algorithms. This is a pre-deep learning algorithm, histogram of oriented gradients, which was the best object detection uh, algorithm. So recognizing what's moving around in the video, very important for things like driver assistance. Uh, and its accuracy wasn't that good, less than 40% of, of the objects were correctly detected. Moving to CNN-based object detection greatly improved the situation, so AlexNet took that to nearly 60%, and going to uh, larger CNNs improved it further. But they use a lot more computation. So the energy, uh, this is a, the energy in picojoules per pixel, so the units don't matter that much, but basically we're up a couple orders of magnitude with a relatively small CNN, and three or four orders of magnitude in terms of power dissipation with a complicated CNN that gets more state-of-the-art results. And video compression is down here. So basically, it used to be that you could detect objects in a video with an amount of energy that was close to what it took to just compress, decompress, process the video. With these more advanced algorithms, you're actually using order of mag orders of magnitude more power. So that is a problem. Um, so the power can be a lot higher, is a lot higher with these deep learning algorithms. Is, is that a concern? Well, it is. So here's, let's take self-driving cars or driver assistance and hopefully one day self-driving. So a Chevy Bolt is an electric car and in the city its engine consumes about six kilowatts of power. And that obviously is what ultimately limits its range. So this is something that is a key metric for this car. NVIDIA's driver assistance board, so multiple GPUs in a system that's targeted at uh, driver assistance and then one day autonomous driving, but it doesn't have enough compute power to do autonomous driving. You would need many of these and better algorithms. So this is really more driver assistance at this point. It takes 500 watts. So that's actually a significant fraction of the power that your engine takes. It's actually going to have a noticeable effect on the range of an electric car. And this isn't enough yet, right? We're going to need a lot more compute than that if we want to go all the way to autonomous. Uh, this is an Audi autonomous driving prototype, and the, you can see there's a lot of computer hardware in the trunk. The one thing that's missing is actually space for suitcases, okay? So there's a serious downside to this autonomous driving car. It can drive itself, but it's not actually going to take many passengers or much luggage. Now, clearly this is a prototype, but it shows it has to be shrunk. It has to get more efficient. Uh, when you start talking about things like you know, doorbells and smart video cameras, clearly the power constraints are a lot smaller still because a car's got a much bigger power plant than those devices. Okay, so that's one of the places where we want machine learning to be deployed, in the edge, in devices that we carry around or drive around. But a lot of machine learning obviously is also done in data centers where the, you know, the, the raw inputs are transferred through the network up to the data center and it's processed there. And those data centers are huge. So this is a picture of a, a Google data center just to give the sense of the, of the scale of them. And there are many data centers like this around the world. Uh, Microsoft won't say exactly how many servers they have in their data centers, but by a process of binary search, asking questions of various Microsoft engineers, it's clear it's more than a million, and it's growing at 30% a year. So There's an incredible number of computers that are in data centers around the world consuming power, and one of their main workloads is now machine learning inference for things like speech recognition. 
Power is 30% of a data center's cost, so it's a big operating cost. If you can reduce the power, uh, data center operators are, are happy. Their key metric in optimizing a data center is performance, so how much computation can I get done divided by watts divided by dollars. So they care about the cost of the computer hardware, they also care about the power consumption, and they, they normalize it by how much compute can they get done. The forecast <coughs> from, from this report is that uh, by 2025, three to 6% of the world's electricity will be used in data center, which is a shockingly high number. So, so there's an environmental impact even to these data centers as well as an economic impact of building more and more data centers. And data centers, you might think, well, you've moved the data from somewhere at the edge up to the data center, so should we care about latency at all? Clearly, in, in a self-driving car, we care a lot about latency. So we need to not only, uh, we want to be power efficient, but we also need answers quickly. If, if there's a, a pedestrian coming at us, we want to know that right away. It's not uh, acceptable to... Uh, to wait a while. And a lot of machine learning inference approaches to get good efficiency, they actually uh, batch up a lot of inputs and, and then run them through all at once. And that's fine for training, but when you're doing inference in something like a car, it's not acceptable. You wouldn't want to basically take 30 frames of video, run them all through your compute hardware and see, did you find a pedestrian in them? And it tells you 30 times, yes, I found a pedestrian because by then you've already run the pedestrian over. You need to send each frame of video in and get an answer of is there a pedestrian or not. And that's actually changes the compute problem some. Okay, so in the data center though, where it might be less obvious that there are latency constraints, there often are. So Google, in their ISCA 2017 paper that introduced the, the TPU, so a, a machine learning hardware accelerator, uh, said that they have a seven millisecond constraint for interact, uh, a key interactive cloud service. They didn't say exactly which one it was, but they said they had to hit that, that constraint. Microsoft basically wants as low as possible. They've also been working on low latency uh, machine learning inference. So they've achieved less than two milliseconds, which sounds like, well, that's so low, do you really need to get that low? And the reason they wanted that low is they find that they, many of their algorithms that they're running are a concatenation of several machine learning inference problems. So if each one of them is under two milliseconds, the developers are much more productive. They can basically combine them, they can construct a pipeline that uses multiple machine learning models in sequence and does something interesting, and it's still low enough latency that the end user uh, is not annoyed. Okay, so uh, hopefully I've convinced you that there are two things we, we want. Well, I guess three things. We want machine learning inference to be efficient in power, in cost, and want it to be low latency. Those are all highly desirable features. Okay, so how can you do that? Okay, well, you can do it with specialized hardware. Um, well, one, the first thing you can do, which I imagine most of the people here are, uh, are, are working on, so we're, the world is counting on good results from this institute and others like it around the world, which is find algorithms with less compute and less memory bandwidth. So get the same accuracy, but do it with less computation. And, and there has been a lot of you know, really good work in that area to try to make simpler networks that still get uh, good answers. So that's clearly part of the solution. But the other thing we can do <coughs> is actually change the compute hardware. So make it less general purpose, more optimized for deep learning. And deep learning is important enough that this is happening. So developing computer hardware is very expensive. If this was a minor application, no one is gonna go make specialized chips for it. Intel is not gonna start optimizing their chips for it. But the compute load of deep learning is high enough and growing that uh, this will happen, this is happening. Uh, and we can also do both. So if we change the compute hardware to be more efficient for today's algorithms, we can also look at, well, maybe the algorithm could further change to take advantages, advantage of uh, features of that new hardware. Okay, so CPUs are you know, the, the dominant, most important way to do a computation. Easiest to program, most general purpose. Uh, but they are wasteful in energy. So this is a 45 nanometer CPU energy breakdown it's from Mark Horowitz of Stanford. To, to get the instruction, you know, CPU first needs to be told every cycle, what are you doing? So 25 picojoules to actually get the instruction from the instruction cache. Six picojoules to get your data from the register file, which is your best case. You know, your data is right in the register file. You know, if it was further away in memory, it's in a data cache or even worse, DRAM. This is much higher, so that's the best case. Control logic, so you set all sorts of multiplexers and select signals based on this instruction to get the data to the right spot. So the total is 70 picojoules. 
which doesn't sound like a lot, but obviously we're doing this billions of times a second in, in many CPUs, so it adds up. The actual operation you wanted to do in this case was three one hundredths of a picojoule for an 8-bit add, so very small compared to the energy we just spent. And even for a 32-bit floating point add, which is a lot more complicated than an 8-bit integer add, it's only 0.9 picojoules. So 1.5% of the total power actually went to the computation we wanted. For an 8-bit add, it's far under 1%. So very wasteful. Um, a GPU improves this some by having the same instruction operate on multiple pieces of data. Um, that's it. So it does get more energy efficient, but not that much more energy efficient. Not enough that, uh, that it solves the whole problem. Okay, so what else could we do? So that's kind of our two different cl main classes of CPUs, or CPUs and, and GPUs. Uh, well, you can actually have hardware directly operate on the data, which is closer to what our brain does, if we want to take a biological analogy. Things that we're bad at, like math. So you want to add two numbers, you say 5 plus uh, 5 equals 10, carry the 1. You're kind of thinking step by step of what to do. And those are things that you know we know we're not terribly efficient at. Our vision system, we have all sorts of neurons that are just detecting edges and then detecting corners, and it all happens without really conscious thought. So you can build hardware that is closer to that model, where instead of being driven by instructions, it just does things. It does one thing, it does it well. Uh, this is a, so the question is, how much more efficient is that? If instead of having instructions, you just have hardware that does something, and then it sends its data to the next hardware unit, how much more efficient can that be? Uh, so this is a paper <clears throat> from a few years ago where they took six compute kernels, and they had different data types. They ranged from one-bit data to 32-bit data. Uh, and they mapped, they, they basically measured the power on a, an optimized CPU, so a vector CPU, which is more like a GPU. Every instruction is actually controlling the processing of multiple pieces of data. So they found their best power came when they had a, a vector processor where every instruction was causing eight pieces of data to be processed. Um, and they compared that to what if they built dedicated hardware for that exact problem that just did that one thing. And there's a wide range. The gap is the biggest when you have one-bit data. It's a bit smaller when you have 32-bit. But the gap was shockingly high. Um, the vector processor was 25 times slower. So it took 25 times as long to complete the calculation. And it took 36 times more area on a chip. So if you put that together, your efficiency, how much can I get done in a certain time in a certain amount of silicon, is 900 times worse. So it, it, it's a soberingly large number. There's a lot of wastage. Uh, by using these more general purpose processors. Okay, so but is, could we actually do this? This is kind of a limit study. What if we just built hardware that did one thing? Uh, that's all it knows how to do. It's completely, perfectly specialized to the application. Um, so could, is that a realistic thing to do? Can we build hardware that specialized? Well, we, we can build it, but it probably makes no economic sense to do so. So this, uh, <clears throat> this is data from Jeff Dean of Google, uh, and it's showing in the blue curve, well, let's start with the red curve. The red curve is Moore's law, okay? So how many more transistors can we fit on a chip over time? And this is actually optimistic. Moore's law is slowing down. This is showing a doubling every two years, which we're no longer achieving. So we're not quite doing as well as that. But the blue curve, which is growing more quickly, are machine learning archive papers per year, okay? So currently, machine learning researchers are generating algorithmic results faster than Intel is generating transistors. It's kind of an amazing achievement. Um, <clears throat> this really highlights there are rapid algorithm changes. It would be, you know, it's not, it's not a feasible thing to commit to silicon that has no programmability, no ability to adapt uh, some specific algorithm and say that's the one that's going to win the world and that's going to go in all the systems that, or enough systems that I'm going to make money off of it. Uh, we've got many different applications. So the limit study I showed you was basically making hardware for one thing. When we're in the edge, so we're not in the data center, but we're in cars and cameras and so on, we need to integrate in diverse, into different systems, and those systems have different inputs and outputs. So that's also a problem if you have no programmability. You, uh, you have no ability to get data from different places or deal with different formats. So, so we can't do this. So we still need some programmability. But all of what I showed you hopefully highlights that <clears throat> there is an opportunity to do a lot better than CPUs or even specialized uh, processors like GPUs, if we can be clever enough. 
Okay, so why many people are pursuing this. So the AI investment in 2016 was estimated by McKinsey at 26 to $39 billion. So it's a huge amount of money. So there's a, there's a big pot of gold out there. Um, and that's led to a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of people coming up with the same idea of we're gonna need more efficient compute hardware. So there are at least 45 computer chip startups targeting uh, various forms of deep learning and machine learning. There was $1.5 billion in venture capital raised in 2017 uh, to fund these startups. Uh, and they're using all sorts of different approaches. So the, probably the most conventional one is arrays of vector CPUs. So uh, kind of like a GPU, but more specialized to the application domain. <clears throat> a, little, a little more different is uh, what Google's done with their tensor processing unit, which is basically matrix, a hardware matrix multiply unit that's very efficient and some, some limited control to basically get data for it. Uh, it's quite efficient, but it, uh, isn't that low latency because it, it relies on batching to get enough data together to be able to phrase a machine learning computation as a matrix matrix multiply. So that's a good way to be efficient. It's not a good way to be low latency. Uh, and then there are more radical approaches like company, there's an interesting company that is basically uh, modifying flash memory to allow it to do analog multiply accumulate, so it can actually do massively parallel, low energy multiply accumulate, but it's analog and therefore not as accurate. So there's a lot of different approaches. Um, so there's a little, instead of pot of gold, it's a little bit of Game of Thrones because most of these companies are gonna die. So there is a big reward, but there is high risk. Uh, but some of these will almost certainly be successful. Uh, most won't. So it's not going to be in all likelihood, just one answer. There will be several successful answers. What I'm gonna talk about uh, for the rest of this talk is a certain kind of computer chip. Uh, so um, uh, as I said, there are a lot of different approaches to this, but FPGAs are one kind of approach to this. So these chips can directly implement computations and directly transfer data. So actually, how many people know what an FPGA is? How many people have heard of it? Okay, so quite a few. Uh, so I'm going to quickly go over what they are. In, in any case, there are a few people who don't know what they are. So we don't have to use instructions with an FPGA. We can basically just directly have our compute units do something and directly send data uh, where we need it. But the compute units and the wiring are both programmable. By putting in a different bit stream, we can actually rewire the chip and change its function. So we still have programmability. Uh, the fit to deep learning is that we can build the exact compute units we need. We can build them at any precision. Uh, and obviously there's a lot of research and deep learning about what is the best precision for a given accuracy, given algorithm, there's no one answer. So very flexible in that space. You can build a custom memory subsystem uh, and you can directly wire some outputs to some inputs. So it helps you with efficiency, it can also help you with latency where you can really adapt to the algorithm. Uh, and we can also, looking beyond just the machine learning algorithm but the system, we can build custom I.O. interfaces to any sensors. So if you're in a car or a phone, you, you have to get the data in. And your data may be, you want it low latency. So actually directly implementing those interfaces in hardware instead of software lowers their latency and allows you to talk to strange things where there may not be a standard chip that gets to that sensor. The downside is there is a significant overhead for this uh, programmability. So it depends on exactly what you're doing, but it slows your chip down by approximately 3x and costs you 4x to 10x area versus building an, a chip that it doesn't have this programmability. So it's not gonna be nearly as good as that limit study I showed you uh, of what if we just built dedicated hardware, but it is reusable. Uh, and it is also generally more complicated to create your system. So there are some higher level tools to help you, but in general, you're working with a more lower level substrate, so you're gonna do more work to define your system. Okay, so FPGA architecture in two minutes, maybe one minute. So the most basic elements in, in almost all FPGAs is a lookup table. So you can do a small logic function, any logic function you want by programming its truth table into some SRAM cells, and then inputs. Here I have four inputs. Depending on the state of the four inputs, I'm gonna pick one of these uh, cells and output it. So that allows me to do any function I want of four inputs. I need register, so I also have a register, and I might, design my FPGA where I can either use the registered output or the combinational output, and I control that again with another SRAM cell, because I've got to pre-build all this and be able to just program it. So those logic elements are grouped together, 
into bigger things called a logic block. So we group a few of these with some local wiring and multiplexers so they can talk to each other and do bigger functions. We take those and we arrange them typically to make the layout of the chip tractable. They're arranged in columns. So we make a column of logic blocks. We do that a whole bunch of times to make an array. We need IOs. Again, usually we put those in columns to make the layout easier. <coughs> make a lot of different RAM blocks uh, so we can build these are just basic RAM blocks that we're going to wire together to build our memory subsystem. And DSP blocks, which are basically multiply accumulate units, and again, a lot of them arranged in columns. Uh, on top of those, we put routing wires. So the routing wires are, again, prefabricated, both horizontally and vertically. And the way we are able to programmably connect these things is that where they, at some of the points where they cross, we put a multiplexer. And we control that multiplexer with some SRAM cells we could program. So now we can choose, after the chip's fabricated, you know, what talks to what by programming these multiplexers. So, so these techniques of using lookup tables instead of gates and using multiplexers to connect wires are what makes this programmable, but they're also what gives it that overhead. They cost more area than if we just built the exact gates we needed and built only the wires we needed with no multiplexing. Okay, so this is a picture of what this looks like. This is a, a real layout plot of a 40 nanometer FPGA, one of the ones that I designed when I was at uh, Altera. The blue is the logic. So most of the chip area, or the largest part of the chip area are the, those logic blocks. So the lookup tables that are arranged to bigger groups. The next biggest thing are these RAM blocks in red. This particular chip has two different sizes of RAM blocks and it has thousands of those RAM blocks and tens of thousands of these lookup tables. It's a reasonable amount of area that goes to multiply accumulate, but certainly not most of the device. It's quite a bit less than the RAM and logic. Uh, so these are columns are uh, you know, about 1,000 on this chip or 2,000 multiply accumulate units. Uh, and then there are a bunch of I.O. So I.O. matters a lot in these systems. So there's programmable I.O. that lets you connect to all sorts of different things. There's programmable clocking. And more I.O. that allows you to talk to very fast things like Ethernet at high speeds. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to show you, that was kind of what is an FPGA. I'm going to show you a couple of uh, case studies that show some benefits of using these for, for deep learning. So this one is one that was done at uh, Intel Labs, where Andrew Boutros, one of my students, is, is currently. Um, and this is actually Intel Labs kind of replicating and assisting Microsoft. So Microsoft are the first, Microsoft did this first. They, they run a lot more uh, recurrent neural networks than convolutional neural networks. So this is an estimate of the workload in their data centers, and it's much more recurrent neural networks than it is uh, convolutional neural networks. So that's what they care about the most. So Microsoft has put an FPGA in every one of those you know, million plus servers. So their servers now in their data centers are two CPUs, two Xeon class CPUs and one FPGA. And uh, Microsoft to accelerate uh, these recurrent neural networks, um, and also multilayer perceptrons, but what they mostly publish is the recurrent neural networks, move the computation into the FPGAs. Okay, so the work I'm showing you here is Intel's work, because Intel FPGAs are what is in Microsoft's data center, so Intel's very keen to understand what Microsoft did, see how they can evolve their chips, so they essentially replicated the Microsoft uh, system without access to the source code. Uh, so, uh, this kind of just reiterates some of the things that I told you earlier, that uh, latency matters a lot, and the constraints are, are getting lower. So Google was shooting for 10 milliseconds uh, in 2014, 7 in 2016. Microsoft was shooting for 4 with Brainwave, but actually achieved 2, and now appears to have set that as you know, a goal that they're happy with. Uh, and these recurrent neural networks are, tend to be memory-bound rather than compute-bound especially when you're going for low latency. You're actually trying to get one set of inputs and run them through your recurrent neural network rather than batching up a whole bunch of problems and sending them through one uh, in a batch. Uh, so Microsoft is not batching, neither is Intel in this work, because they want the lowest latency. And that means that you're memory bound. You spend a lot of time getting your weights on chip and less time actually multiplying your weights times your activations, whereas CNNs don't have nearly as many weights uh, and therefore, they're more compute bound. It's, it's easier to get all the data on the chip. 
Okay, so what Intel did in this work and Microsoft did before them is they keep the entire model in the on-chip memory. Uh, so they get rid of that problem of uh, their memory bandwidth limited, bringing the weights on the chip uh, constantly as they go through these recurrent neural networks. Um, and they're not the only ones doing this. So as I said, Microsoft's done this with FPGAs. Um, when their model gets really big, they actually take a very interesting approach. So Microsoft has you know, a million plus FPGAs in their data centers. When their recurrent neural network is too big to fit in the on-chip memory, and this chip has about 30 megabytes of uh, memory, they just split the network across multiple chips. So they, uh, they don't batch, they basically uh, use more space. And this actually goes back to the low latency I.O. processing of an FPGA. Because the FPGAs are connected by fast network interfaces that go straight into the hardware, they can actually split the network across multiple chips and, and it's still efficient because they have that fast I.O. Um, so Baidu is actually doing a similar thing of basically keeping all of the weights on chip but in GPUs and NVIDIA has added uh, support to that in their CUDA DNN. Okay, so how well did it, did it work? So the, this is actually a slightly older version of my slides. Let's see if I got the right ones or not. Um, <clears throat> so this is the result from the Intel paper. So the blue bar is what the GPU gets on a range of recurrent neural networks. So it's by definition gets a, uh, a speed of one. When they, in 32-bit floating point, move it to an FPGA, they get some speed up. Speed ups are better when the recurrent neural network is, is more complicated. And when they go to 8-bit data, uh, they get a, a further speed up because the data paths in the FPGA get smaller and they can fit more compute units on the FPGA and they wind up getting a, a nice speed up. Okay, so why, why this performance gap? It's basically the customized on-chip uh, memory hierarchy. So the GPU has very high peak throughput, uh, particularly for the 32-bit case, but it, it doesn't achieve most of it. It's far below its uh, computational peak because it can't provide the data in time to the compute units. Uh, the FPGA with a custom memory system that's been built into it, programmed into it, achieves a much higher fraction of its peak compute bandwidth, uh, and that's what gives it a better performance. Okay, so uh, next I was gonna talk about a sparse CNN accelerator, so not a recurrent neural, neural network, now a, a convolutional neural network, that's being built by uh, Matthew Hall, who's here, uh, on an FPGA. Uh, this is kind of a reiteration of what I talked about a bit earlier. If we want to make neural networks more computationally efficient, we could make the network architecture more efficient somehow, simplify it without losing accuracy. We could reduce the parameter precision, or we could prune the parameters. We could try to get rid of some of our weights so we get rid of some of our multiplies. Uh, so this just illustrates that. So the perhaps hardest on the algorithm developer is to find a way to get good accuracy with less computation. So instead of, for convolutional neural nets, instead of doing a three-dimensional convolution across uh, many layers, uh, we could do just two-dimensional convolutions. So we're doing much less processing, but it puts more stress on the network because we actually are not gathering data across all these layers. So there's been a bunch of work on, well, can we just replace 3D convolution with 2D or could we do a 2D convolution and then after that do a 1D convolution? Both those things save a lot of compute. They cost some accuracy, but by uh, increasing the number of neurons, you can capture some of that back. Uh, so a lot of work in network engineering to try to be more efficient. The other thing you can do, or second thing you do, is reduce precision. So we don't really need to have very precise numbers. We can uh, use much lower precision and the complexity of a, the hardware complexity, hardware cost of a multiplier basically goes down quadratically as you make the precision lower. So if I've cut the precision by a factor of two, I actually cut my energy, my area, et cetera, by about a factor of four. Uh, and then the last thing we can do is prune parameters. So instead of having uh, weights that are non-zero for our whole network, if we can find a lot of them are close to zero and we actually threshold them to zero and we build clever enough hardware, maybe we could just avoid doing those multiplies completely and take them out of the computation. Okay, so re-architecting the network is, is obviously very powerful if you can do it, but it's also quite hard. 
So this is basically thrown back to the algorithm developer of you've, you've made a, an accurate network because you do it now using a different approach that takes less compute. Uh, and it's not clear it can be done for, for all models. Reducing the precision and pruning in an existing network can be done in a more cookie cutter way. Uh, you can build algorithms that can do that after the developer is, uh, is done engineering the network with basically a final training phase. So that is much easier to apply to a previously trained network, so more easily deployable across a wider range of things. Um, okay, so pruning an existing network is what's gonna lead to a, a sparse CNN. So and that's what Matthew is trying to accelerate. So he's trying to take a sparse CNN that has less computation, so it's more efficient, and then also uh, move that onto more specialized hardware. Uh, and the reason for that is that unstructured data doesn't work that well on GPUs. Um, you've got complicated address computations that steal time from your multiplication. Your GPU is spending more time figuring out where is the data rather than actually doing multiplications. Uh, so this costs you some of your benefit, maybe all your benefit um, for getting rid of multiplications. Uh, and a GPU is set up for really very regular memory accesses where it can get data to all the compute units if the data is laid out nicely, so it all comes from different banks and goes to all the compute units. If it's not laid out nicely, not only does it take you longer to figure out where your data is, you may not actually be able to access it all uh, at the, in the same cycle because of hardware limitations that you can't get rid of. Okay, so with a sparse convolution on a GPU, you're doing some multiplications, you're doing some address computations, uh, and then you're storing the data with bank conflicts. You may not be able to store it all in, in the same cycle. You have to actually spread that over multiple cycles. So we're losing some of our gain by spending less time on multiplications due to these other two things. Okay, so these more regular computations look like a, an interesting target for a more programmable platform like an FPGA because we can change it more. Uh, so this is, it reiterates what an FPGA is. Um, we have lots of multipliers, which we need for neural networks. The thousands of small on-chip memories uh, allow us to build that custom memory subsystem and deal with more complicated, unstructured data. Uh, we have lots of adders, tens of thousands of adders, so we can compute the addresses at the same time we're doing the multiplications, so extract more, multiplicate, more parallelism. Um, the other thing that FPGAs are good at is low precision. And I'll talk a little more about that uh, in another couple, uh, another few slides. Okay, so how can we get a gain from sparsity? So here, here's a, a map of weights with the black ones being zero. So they've been thresholded out by the training algorithm and the colored ones being non-zero. Uh, and only some of our neurons are actually gonna activate. So some of our activations are also zero and some are non-zero. So, you know, with kind of a conventional architecture, we're just gonna wind up doing all the multiplications between all these weights and all these activations anyway, even though a lot of them are zero. But an alternative approach, which is what Matthew is following, is to basically compress these sparse weights, so store them uh, densely, get rid of the zeros. Now it needs to store indices to say which, you know, which weight are you? So he knows where did you come from? They're stored in the memories uh, densely, but he needs to know what weight they are. And the same thing for the activations. So they're stored in the memory densely, but need to store indices to know where they are, where they came from. Okay. And then the hardware walks through and basically does all the non-zero multiplications and only the non-zero multiplications. So all these weights get multiplied by all these activations, and then all these weights get multiplied by all these activations. Okay, so if 85% of the weights are zero, um, which is what Matthew's currently achieving for some of the networks he's taken, and 50% of the activations are, are zero, which is also achieving, that means that 92% of our multiplies are actually zero. We don't actually have to do them. We only have to do 8% of the multiplies. So possibly big savings in, in how much computation we've done. Um, so it sounds great, but there is a difficulty. So we know that each weight will multiply each non-zero activation. Uh, so 
we do that and get all of those products. Um, but now we need to take all of these products and figure out which ones to add together to actually produce the correct data for the output layer. Okay, and they, they wind up going all over the place. Okay, so we get a very irregular set of memory accesses to put these, sum these up and put them back. Uh, and yeah, as, as Matthew wrote here, if it, it looks like a mess is because it is a mess and he's been dealing with that mess for quite a while, thinking hard about it and how to optimize it. Uh, so this architecture of just do the minimum multiplies, multiply the non-zero weights times the non-zero activations was originally proposed in ISCA 2017. And they were proposing an ASIC. They didn't actually build the ASIC. So it's an NVIDIA that proposed this. They didn't actually build it because again, it's the problem of building custom hardware that does one thing is, is limiting. So they proposed it, but didn't build it. Matthew is building it instead in an FPGA. Uh, so that he doesn't have to spend $100 million to build it. He can do it in a programmable chip. And they used uh, scattering. They basically sent the data to uh, wherever it's, it needs to wind up for the final accumulation. But in an FPGA, that's actually much less efficient. Uh, so he's rethought, how do you do that? So he's adapting the algorithm to the hardware architecture that he's targeting. So an FPGA, as I said earlier, has multipliers, small memories, and lots of... Uh, small function generators, lookup tables, and adders. The multipliers and the small memories are about as efficient as you would get on some dedicated hardware chip. They're made in basically the same way, so they're a little less efficient, but not that much. But the, the small functions, which are built out of lookup tables instead of gates and use a lot of programmable routing, are quite a bit less efficient than you get if you built your own hardware. Uh, so what Matthew's done is basically try to use a lot of the multipliers and the small memories and minimize how much he uses the, uh, the less efficient logic functions. Okay, so, yeah, so I guess basically at a high level, try to do it with more memory and less logic. And the details of that turn out to be pretty complicated, so we won't get into them. The result is that for uh, ResNet 50, 85% weight sparsity, so only 15% of the weights are non-zero. Uh, we actually wind up being limited by the on-chip memory of the FPGA. This is a smaller FPGA than, than the Intel and Microsoft uh, paper that I talked about earlier is using. So he's limited by the memory on the FPGA. Can't actually use all the multipliers. There are actually more than 2,000 multipliers on this chip, but he runs out of memory space before he can use all the multipliers. Uh, despite that, achieves an inference latency of four to six milliseconds. Comparing that to the best uh, non-sparse, you know, conventional, just do all the multiplications, whether they're zero or not, architecture, which was designed by Intel, it's called their deep learning accelerator. It basically goes in an FPGA, but it's uh, basically an IP core that you can buy from Intel. It uses all the multipliers. It runs at a slightly higher clock frequency, but because it has to do all those multiplications, it doesn't get to skip over the zero ones. Its latency is, is higher. So even though it's using half, only half as many multipliers, uh, it's 1.5 to 2x faster than a dense accelerator, like a really well-optimized dense accelerator. The on-chip memory is the bottleneck. So one of the future works is to basically look at, well, how can we change the chip? Now that we know that that is a bottleneck, Part of what my group wants to do is look at how can we change these chips for the future to make them better still. Okay, and that leads into some changes that we've already evaluated for this kind of chip, but how can we make them more effective for deep learning? Okay, so the most kind of obvious uh, gap between an FPGA and custom hardware, we looked at where are we losing efficiency? Where's the programmability costing us? And the biggest single place where it's costing us is in multiply accumulate. It's the most dominant computation in a deep learning network, and not being as efficient as if you built dedicated hardware is the biggest cost of programmability. Um, so we want to see, well, can we be more efficient at multiply accumulate? So that raises the question of what precision of multiply accumulate, and there's no, no agreement whatsoever. So you can look at it two ways. What are, what are chips providing? And they're providing a lot of different precisions. So GPUs provide single precision or 32-bit float. Uh, we've also got now eight floating point 16 formats, so less precise formats. GPUs have deployed those. The deep learning accelerator on an FPGA that I just talked about uses 16-bit floats. 
Nirvana has a custom chip where they use 16-bit floats. And there are actually multiple variants of 16-bit floats. These aren't all actually the same, even though they sound the same. Microsoft Brainwave, which is that project that did uh, recurrent neural nets at very low latency in their data centers on FPGAs, they made their own custom floating point format. So they made FP8 and FP9, and they used that in their, uh, in their recurrent neural networks. And actually, most of these bits are for the exponent. So the actual precision is very low. They actually only have, uh, in their favorite implementation, they only use three bits of Mantissa. So the precision is really three bits. And the other bits are the exponents so they can shift around the data. Uh, you don't necessarily need floating points. You can save har more hardware if you use fixed points. You just do everything with integers. So int 16, int 8, even int 4. Uh, and then people have gone further to binary uh, and ternary. So ternary is basically two-bit representations. Binary, you can only uh, have weights that are one or negative one, so very limiting. Um, so in terms of what hardware you can build, uh, FPGAs can build this, not much else can build it. But when we go to these other ones, we've got various chips that have chosen to score different precisions. So there's no agreement there. This plot might be hard to see, but it's from, uh, it's from Xilinx, a presentation they gave a year ago. And this is, they, they looked at a whole bunch of networks and they're implementing them in hardware, they're implementing them in FPGAs. Um, and they changed the precision and then retuned the network. So they tried to find what is the most efficient uh, network for a given accuracy target for image classification. And if they needed the highest classification average accuracy, then usually the mo they needed to go to 8-bit weights. But if they could tolerate a little bit of accuracy loss, then it was all over the map what was the most efficient precision. Might be 4-bit, might be 1-bit, might be 2-bit. So it's a complicated plot, but the takeaway from it is depending on what your network is, what your accuracy target is, your most efficient implementation after you change everything, the precision and then re-architect the network, is unknown. You really have to go figure it out. That's actually very good for FPGAs because they can build any precision you want. Their data paths are, are single bit customizable. So you can do binary, you can do ternary, you can do four bit, you can do anything you want. Um, that's true of the logic fabric, but it's not true of those DSP blocks, the multiply accumulate blocks. So this is a, an Intel DSP block. It's basically built to do two things. It can do a single 27 by 27 multiply, or it can do two 19 by 18. Uh, so again, those are your options. But often in machine learning, we want lower precisions than that. So we looked at, well, how, how much cost would it be to add a little bit of hardware to this to allow us to try to reuse as much of that as we can, but fracture it down to smaller multipliers? And a lot of the cost of these blocks is actually their interface to the programmable routing, the muxes you need to connect the signals. So don't add any programmable routing and reuse as much hardware as we can. Uh, so we proposed an enhanced DSP block that supports everything the previous one did, but also four 9-bit multiplies and eight 4-bit. Uh, and the over overhead of that's quite small. So it made the block itself 12% bigger. But because most of the chip is not these DSP blocks, the chip only becomes 0.6% bigger. Uh, and it can still run just as fast. So then we looked at, okay, what does this translate into on an actual deep learning application? Uh, we did this on a bunch of applications, but I'm showing here uh, one, VGG16. And... Uh, and we also looked at it for a few different ways we could organize the hardware. This one is the one that was the most efficient. It organizes it in the same way that Intel's deep learning accelerator organizes the hardware. So depending on how many multipliers we use, how much parallelism we go for, we get different uh, performance. So higher is, is more operations per second. And this chip has enough multipliers that we can go a little over eight a little over 3,000 multipliers in the DSP blocks, and after that we have to start using the uh, logic fabric to build more multipliers. Uh, so if we want the highest throughput, we'd go somewhere around here. We're getting diminishing returns out here because the chip is getting so full it's starting to slow down. We've got so much uh, routing, so many signals flying around that our clock rate's dropping. Uh, and this is showing 8-bit multipliers. This is if we can do the neural network in 4-bit. When we make that change, which had a very small area cost, we get the red curve. So now we can go all the way to over 6,000 uh, mul multipliers before we run out of DSP blocks, because we can fit twice as many in, or for 4-bit, 12,000. So we can basically go to higher levels of parallelism and maintain our clock frequency better. So we can get uh, significantly more throughput. 
1.2x for 8-bit, 1.5x 